Anthony Bourdain occupies a unique and influential place in popular culture. He can turn a restaurant into a hit with just one visit or turn a previously unheard of food combination into a sensation with just one bite. And he sparked quite a few online wars with a single tweet, not unlike a certain U.S. president. Not bad for a reformed party boy. Our conversation in a moment, but first, a little kitchen prep. Anthony Bourdain first gained notoriety with his book, Kitchen Confidential, a tell-all look at the restaurant business. He followed that up with a slew of best-selling books and TV shows that have made him a star. In 2012, Bourdain upped his game again. There's something about this place that I think I'm going to like. He began his latest adventure as host of Parts Unknown. The program, of course, focuses on food, but it's just as much about history, culture, even politics. Last fall, Bourdain shared a meal with then U.S. President Barack Obama. To, to many Our more called the U.S. President. These days, though, Bourdain is spending more of his time preparing food for someone even more important. His new book, Appetites, is all about his unconventional American family and cooking for his young daughter. I met up with Anthony Bourdain earlier in Toronto. So nice to meet you. Good to meet you. I've been following you for years. I think, I think every man I know wants to be you, and <laughs> half the women too. It's, has it really been that exciting? Or tell me it's really been hard, hard work, um, awful. No, I'm having a really good time. I mean, I, I worked essentially a blue collar job for 30 years of my life. Uh, now I, I have the best job in the world. One of your most famous meals was in Vietnam with uh, Barack Obama. Yes. It looks like it's just the two of you kind of like hanging out, but I imagine it might have been a bit more intense than that. Uh, actually, because of the, look, the Secret Service were not thrilled with our choice of venue because it was this funky family run, not particularly sparkly clean, local favorite noodle joint in an old section of Hanoi. There was no room in the, in the room for anyone other than the customers you see in the background. Uh, the camera guys, one producer, everybody else, Secret Service, everybody else had to be in another room. Uh, so it was very cool of them to take that chance and to put it out there for us. Did you try and get them to eat anything a little outré? Uh, President Obama spent a lot of time in Indonesia as a young man, and uh, he's very sentimental about the street food and those smells and those flavors. So, uh, and he's very, very proficient with chopsticks and uh, Asian food, and uh, I don't think he'd have any difficulty with... Uh, with anything. This is killer. This is outstanding. <laughs> so good to hear. It's really good. Would you do that with Donald Trump? No. I mean, uh, I'm open to sitting down with anyone who's nice to me. Uh, I've sat down with everyone from, you know, Ted Nugent, uh, former chief of counterintelligence for the KGB, uh, uh, Hezbollah, uh, you know, people who I, who I disagree with on many if not every fundamental issue. But I have no expectation. I just find him personally objectionable. Um, I don't think he likes food. And from people I know who have had to endure dinner with him, if, if you enjoy sitting there listening to him talk about himself, you know, great, God bless you. And you know the man, I mean, he only eats steak well done. And if he knows how to use chopsticks, much less able to grasp them with those tiny little <laughs> nubbins, uh, I'd be shocked. Um, you went to Libya years yeah. ago. Things have changed. Uh, well, they sort of changed before our eyes. We planned to go prior to Benghazi. Uh, we arrived post Benghazi. And while we were there, literally the first day we were there, there was this mood of optimism and we were welcomed in the streets. And the next day, you could just feel a shift as things started to go bad before our eyes. It was a very, uh, very tricky frankly dangerous shoot. We met, as we do everywhere, we met a lot of really lovely people. Assalamu alaikum, hello. But I, you know, I wonder, in fact, we, we had to hire this local militia to keep us safe when we went to Misrata. And I have since heard that a lot of the people who were lovely to us and hosted us at a barbecue and looked after us and joked with us and teased us and played with us, and a lot of these guys, over time, as the situation changed, moved over to the other team. I guess you'll not be able to go back. Well, let's all, let's hope that things change. I mean, I, I've been to a lot of places that, that 
I'm not supposed to have a great time in. Or, but I mean, we had a lovely time in Tehran. We were treated very, very, very well as just as random Americans, ordinary people in the street were very welcoming to us. So, you know, a country is not necessarily its government or the people are not necessarily the people in charge, as we found in places like uh, Iran, where we were treated overwhelmingly with great generosity and kindness. I'm not, not going to say that mitigates the behavior of the, the government uh, at all uh, or their policies, but what we find on the ground is often completely at odds with our expectations and the picture that we may have received from uh, the news and the newspapers. You devoted your book to family. Yeah. Um, the joys of being normal. You sort of wrote about that as <laughs> well, a new experience. Yeah. And now you've, you've split. Yeah. So I just, like, are you rethinking about being normal? Or where's no, your... No, I mean, what is normal? Now? I think, you know, uh, what does the American family look like? I mean, I travel 250 days a year. You know, how normal could I ever hope to be? Uh, I think maybe it was an unreasonable expectation. I tried, and at one point, uh, you know, I was feeling really bad about being away from my daughter so much, and I, at one point I, I came home exhausted, and I said, honey, I'm really thinking about, you know, hanging it up maybe in a year or two uh, so I could spend more time with you. She burst into tears. She said, no, Daddy, your job is so interesting. What will I tell my friends? <laughs> so. So you're still cooking for your daughter? I still cook for my daughter. What does she like? Still in and out. She likes me to not repeat. So when I send her to school with a school lunch, she'd like it to be something that's going to freak out her, her classmates. When you were young, living crazy life as a young chef, you did a lot of drugs. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, now there's all of these opioids and everything. W would you have survived with all of the, the crazy stuff that's on the streets these days? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it was probably harder back then. I mean, uh, I was a heroin addict long before the current opioid crisis. You know, people were not over-prescribing, uh, you know, pharmaceutical uh, painkillers. Oxycontin and all these things hadn't happened. If you liked the feeling of opioids, you had to score it on the street. You know, that, that was the option. It was very difficult. It was very dangerous. Uh, in my case, it just ground me down to the point that, that you know, uh, my choices became very stark, either get well or sink. I looked in a mirror and I... I saw somebody worth saving, um, or that I wanted to at least try real hard and save. You know, anybody could find themselves very easily in, in this situation. And, you know, I look back on that and I think about, you know, I think about what I'll tell my daughter, you know. You know, that was daddy. And no doubt about it, but I hope that I'll be able to say that was daddy then, this is daddy now. It's very different now. now you know, the football team and uh, small town white America uh, are just as likely as, you know, the stereotypical inner city troubled youth. Um, it's everywhere now. I mean, it's a huge, huge, huge problem, but it is directly, in my view and in many people's view, directly related to the spread of legitimately prescribed, if over-prescribed, pharmaceutical drugs. So is food just a way of telling a life story? I think it's a very personal thing. People, people tend to be proud of their food. They let their guard down when they talk to you. You see them at their most vulnerable and revealing in a lot of ways. So even people with whom you have really fundamental disagreements uh, and maybe even complete different belief systems, if you're going to intersect anywhere, it's going to be over food and, and how open you are to receiving that food and receiving whatever intent was behind it. You know, uh, I've gotten along with people everywhere in this world and heard some incredible stories, largely because I sit down without an agenda and just ask the very simple question, what's for dinner? What makes you happy? I've really enjoyed talking Thank to you. you. Thank you. If you enjoyed tonight's interview with Anthony Bourdain, we've got many more conversations on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash CBC The National. You can subscribe and let us know what you think.